Our passage today comes from uh, Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 16. And I'm going to re be reading from the Common English Bible Version. Uh, we've closed up our short series called uh, Connecting Six Feet Apart. And before we head into uh, Lent, which is in a couple of weeks, um, I'm gonna, we're going to hit uh, one of the Acts passages to continue our Acts series from earlier in the summer, I suppose. And so uh, we'll, we'll do this one Acts sermon, and then we'll follow the lectionary for um, our Lent series. Man, time is flying because it's almost Lent. But again, I'm in Acts 17, uh, verses, beginning in verses 16 in the Common English Bible Version. While Paul waited for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to find that the city was flooded with idols. He began to interact with the Jews and Gentile God worshipers in the synagogue. He also addressed whoever happened to be in the marketplace each day. Certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers engaged him in discussion too. Some said, what an amateur. What's he trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods. They said this because he was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They took him into custody and brought him to the council on Mars Hill. What is this new teaching? Can we learn about what you're talking about? You've told us some strange things and we want to know what they mean. They said this because all Athenians as well as the foreigners who live in Athens used to spend their time doing nothing but talking about or listening to the newest thing. Paul stood up in the middle of the council on Mars Hill and said, People of Athens, I see that you are very religious in every way. As I was walking through the town and carefully observing your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. What you worship as unknown, I now proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in temples made with human hands, nor is God served by human hands, as though he needed something, since he is the one who gives life, breath, and everything else. From one person, God created every human nation to live on the whole earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their lands. God made the nation so they would seek him, perhaps even reach out to him and find him. In fact, God isn't far away from any of us. In, the God, in God, we live, move, and exist. As some of your poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, as God's offspring, we have no need to imagine that the divine being is like a, skull, is like a gold, silver, or stone image made by human skill and thought. God overlooks ignorance of these things in times past, but now directs everyone, everywhere, to change their hearts and lives. This is because God has set a day when he attends, intends to judge the world justly by a man he has appointed. God has given proof to this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection from the dead, some began to ridicule Paul. However, others said, well, we'll hear from you about this again. At that, Paul left the council. Some people joined him and came to believe, including Dionysus, a member of the council on Mars Hill, a woman named Damaris, and several others. God, thank you for the, your word. And we know that your word pierces our hearts, our souls, and our minds. And as we Look at this passage where Paul is debating with the philosophers in Athens, Greece, um, and witnesses to, uh, to the gospel in Jesus Christ, uh, your plan for salvation for all people, all of your offspring. May we um, be pierced uh, in our minds and uh, transformed by your word to be witnesses uh, in the world out there and find common ground. Um, with our brothers and sisters, in Christ's name, amen. So like I said, we're at this retreat center 
here in uh, Cascades Camp and Conference Center, which is our denominations in the Pacific Northwest, the Camp and Conference Center um, that's owned by a denomination that we often go to. Um, but thanks to uh, amazing scholarship, all the clergy have been given a, a free retreat, uh, food, lodging, um, a, a place to relax, look at the lake, go hiking. And my family, uh, we all went hiking today. And as we're hiking, I'm so happy that Isaiah had a ton of questions here. He was really talkative. Usually he's on his phone like, go away, dad. But this time he, he had so many questions. And one of the things he asked me is, dad, how do we know uh, that there is a God? Or how do we know that God is good if there's so much suffering in the world? And part of me is like, son, you're a pastor's kid and you go to church and you do not know the answer to these things? Um, but the other part of me was really happy and really proud because my son was thinking from his, for himself. And I know when I was off um, in college that I struggled and wrestled with my own faith and I had to go through my own process, my own independent thought. So in discussing this with uh, Isaiah, being very proud that he had his own mind as was beginning to think for himself, I said, well, if I put you in a cage and forced you to say, you love me, does that mean you love me? And he said, no. And I said, why? Because you're making me love you. And I said, exactly. You can't force someone to love you because that's not love. And because God is a gentleman and he loves us, he can't force us to love him. And so love, uh, in and of itself innately requires choice, a freedom of will. So the reason why there's suffering in the world is because there's evil in the world. And the reason why there's evil in the world is because God offered human beings choice. And so what do you choose? You need to have something you choose between. You choose between God, a loving God, or you choose between evil, Satan. And Isaiah was like, yeah, I get it. Um, and so that's all to say that we had a great conversation, but it also reminded me that, you know, all throughout history, people have been trying to find the answers to life. Is there a God? What's the purpose of life? What happens when I die? And in our passage in context, Athens, we all know Athens because we've all taken Greek philosophy. We've all uh, read about the Greek gods and the Roman gods. We all know that Athens was the center of philosophical thought. Our own democracy in America comes out of thinking that came from the philosophers in Athens. And while Athens at this time had lost, it was far from being a world power, they have lost their like power and military power because it was the Roman Empire. They were under the Roman Empire at this time. Greece still remained the cultural and philosophical center of the world. So even the Romans admired Greek culture and Greek philosophy and Greek thoughts. Even the Romans uh, named their, uh, the Greek gods gave them Roman names um, to follow after um, the, the Greek God. So Paul in Athens is placed right in the center of thought. And we read in our scripture that many of the people there at these times in this city, all they did was ask and think and talk so they can find out what was the next new thing? What's trending? What's hashtag trending in the world of philosophy? What's hashtag trending in the world of thought? Because we want to know the meaning of life. We want to know how we should live our life. We want to know about the gods and what happens when you die. And so Paul is preaching in the synagogues. He's gone ahead of Timothy and Silas to Berea uh, because he's been getting heat from uh, you know, the uh, Jews have been following him all the way down um, from Thessalonica. Um, the people send him off ahead to Athens. And so he goes to Athens and, you know, he starts, he, he's not quiet, he's not laying low, he just starts arguing and debating in the synagogues, in the Jewish synagogues there. And also it says he goes to the marketplaces, the open air marketplaces. And a lot of times in these marketplaces, these public squares, People would just stand and debate and talk and argue. 
It's like you were in a Starbucks and there's all these people like arguing and talking. That's, that's what these marketplaces were like. And Paul is philosophizing with people. He's engaging with the thinking of the time. The, 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 he's being relevant um, with the relevant thinking and thoughts. And so as he's arguing, some people were like, who is this noob? He's an amateur. We don't know what he's talking about. He's babbling. But uh, two groups, schools of thought. So in Greek philosophy, um, there are oftentimes many schools of thoughts. People believed different things. And these school of thoughts were started by um, famous or popular philosophers. Um, case in point, in our, in our case, uh, the two schools were Epicureans and the Stoics. The Epicureans uh, were founded by Epicurus. Um, they take his name. And oftentimes they were called uh, philosophers of the garden because Epicurus, before he died, he uh, donated his land, uh, which was a garden, uh, to the philosophy, uh, to his philosophy. And people just hung out there and, and, and kind of spread his thinking, spread his philosophies. And the Stoics um, were founded by Zeno. And the Epicureans and the Stoics could are basic, were basically the opposites, the two extremes, the opposites of two extremes. I don't know how to say it. The op, they were at two different extremes of the same continuum. And so just to lay it out very simply, the Epicureans believe that, hey, the gods are distant and they don't care. And they believed in poly, you know, polytheism, that there are many gods, but uh, as is the case with many of the Greek gods, they put human characteristics on all these gods. They were jealous gods. They were, you know, hungry, greedy gods. They were fallible. They, they were power hungry. They struggled and bickered and fought just like human beings did. And these gods were far away and distant and didn't care about people. And so their philosophy was, since they don't care anyways, why do we spend our time being ultra religious and denying ourselves and being disciplined and and being too, uh, too legalistic. Why not, why not just, they're having a good time. They don't care, the gods don't care. They're, ha they're all about pleasuring themselves. So the meaning of life or the end of life is to have the happiest life. So I think I would be an Epicurean if I was in Athens these days. Like take the greatest pleasure, whatever makes you have pleasure and makes you happy. Do that thing. Don't suffer unneedlessly. Needlessly. Isn't that cool? The Stoics were on the opposite end of that. They believed that, you know, there was order in the universe, that, the nat that nature followed reason and logic and a great order, that in this order you can find the gods. And so the meaning and purpose of life was to discipline yourself. Emotion and passion were not good things. They were things that led to destruction, but the point of life was to be in self-denial, to follow, you know, follow the rules, follow logic and order as the highest end. So on one end, the pleasure, happy, <laughs> life is good, people. The other side, oh, be disciplined, blah, blah, blah. But both of these two groups were drawn to Paul and what he was saying. Because what he was saying is that he was pointing to a monotheistic, right? Jews and Christians uh, believe in one God, which is different than polytheism. They believed in one God. And Paul actually uses this to find common ground. Right? He said, I was walking around and I came to one of your altars. And one of these altars, it said, this is an altar to an unknown God. And this altar, this person that you're ignorant of, this unknown God, let me tell you who that is. And we know from, well, in college I, I read um, like the last days of Socrates, the writings of Plato and Socrates. And even in those books, in those philosophies, there's embedded in them the possibility that there is one God instead of the many gods. Like the many gods failed us. The many gods are fallible. 
the many gods were too human-like. But what if there is a one God who's actually strong, who's actually perfect, who's actually all-powerful? Who is that God? And so one thing, to one thing I really like about this is this is the evangelist passage. Because Paul doesn't come into their culture and just throw a bomb and says, you're wrong, you're stupid, it's bad, right? Paul actually finds common ground and says, yeah, I saw this, right, in your culture. You know, and sometimes Christians will say, an altar, right? Oh, that's evil, that's bad. Paul doesn't say, oh, that's not, that's not Christian, that's evil and bad. That says, oh, actually, there's goodness, that's right. You're... You're pointed in the right direction. Now, let me give a name to that. Let me explain to you what you, the mystery that you, you, you feel there's something there. You feel there's a God that should be like that. And so you've built an altar. Let me tell you who that God is. And so that's what Paul goes on. He takes what they already know, what they already experience, and he's drawing them. He's wooing in them into Christianity. And this is where he flips the script. He, he's basically saying, you guys follow a gods, many gods, right, who are fallible, who, you know, experience jealousy, who make you do things and make you sacrifice because they're angry or enraged. But that's not how the one true God is like. The one true God is one God Right? And he is the source. God is the source. The one true God is the source of all things. He gave humanity life. He gives humanity breath. He loves humanity. Everything good, grace, gifts, goodness comes from him. He doesn't demand sacrifices like you. He, does, he doesn't live inside um, temples built by human hands, right? You did not make God. That's what idolatry is. We worship the things our hand, own hands have made. No, God is above that. God has made you humanity. So that's one, one true, powerful, omnipotent, all-knowing, powerful God. Isn't that who you want to worship? And then he finds a second common ground. The second common ground is, we are all God's offspring. As your poets once said, we are all God's offspring, one family under God. Greeks, Jews, Asian, Turkey, all the people who may have been gathered in Athens at the time, Romans, all of the ethnicities, all of these languages that are in, you know, intermingling in this society, in this culture, we are all offspring. Another common ground, basically saying this altar to the unknown God, he is our creator, all of us, and we are one family under him. And he used one man to make all the tribes and languages of the world. But the ultimate intent is that all these tribes, all the languages from wherever you are will seek him. And the word here is to reach for him. In the Greek, it's grope, right? That we would, in our blindness, grope for him, to just to touch him. So if you remember the disciples, when they meet the resurrected Jesus, touch, touch my wounds, touch my scars. That's the same word, touch. It's like, we wander around hoping to touch God, to know that he's real, to know that that is the answer we've been searching for, the altar to the unknown God. Let me tell you who he is. And finally, the question that everyone asks, every society has asked in history, how are we saved? What happens when we die? How do I gain eternal life? We looked at that question two weeks ago. What must I do to gain eternal life? And that's where Paul gives a name to the unknown God, 
Jesus Christ died and was raised up. And this is God's plan of salvation for all of his offspring. Common ground is he died and he was resurrected. And this was so revolutionary. It says in, the, in our scripture that some of the people, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, they were like, this guy is ridiculous. That's stupid. That can't happen. But other people were like interested. They're like, we're going to invite you again next week because we want to hear more about this. So church, what do I glean from this? One, we need to find common ground when we're loving on our neighbor and when we're witnessing as witnesses to the gospel. What does it mean not to reject people because they eat different food or they dress differently or they live this type of lifestyle, but to come on their turf and to seek the things. Like I said to my son, you know, when you are hungry to play video games and you have to play video games or you feel empty, that's your desire to seek after God, but you're just placing it in video games. So the things that we have urges for, our addictions, our desires, our needs, maybe they're just misplaced worship, right? They're just things people are searching for, the altar to the unknown God, but they haven't found it. They haven't put their finger on it. And so they're seeking those things and things that are made by the hands of people. And Jesus is saying, no, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am life. Come, come to me. I'll give you the bread of life. I'll give you living water. Come to me. And as people who follow Jesus, we're to be like Paul and come into the situation and engage people in the world and real and hashtag what's trending, what's relevant to them. But then to find common ground and say, and be able to have the accuracy and the, the, the discernment to say that stuff that you're struggling with, let me tell you what God is saying about that, right? To have that precision, that insight into the world and what they're struggling with. And then secondly, that we're all human. We're all God's offspring and family, whether we're black, white, Asian, Hispanic, Native American, whatever, right? God is wanting to bring all tribes, tongue, and nations um, into worship of him, to grope after him, to seek after him. And so we are his offspring, as the Greek poet said. We are all his offspring. And so as we interact with our neighbors, as we interact with people out there, we need to know that more than enemies or strange, strange people or people we don't understand, these people that we interact with at work, at school, you know, just strangers out there, they're our brothers and they are our sisters and they belong to God. Go and love as Paul loved. Go and engage as Paul engaged in the power of the Holy Spirit. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of your word. And as we run into uh, the thoughts and the philosophies and the, the reasoning in our world today, the hashtag, what is trending? What's culturally, you know, people looking for? What is the next new thing? T tell us what the next new thing. We all know that everyone is seeking after your face, even if they don't know it, they're seeking after something. Help us to be people who can say, hey, that thing you're seeking, it's Jesus, it's my Jesus. Come, come discover him with me. Give us words to say in the, in the right moments. Help us to have discernment um, in the Holy Spirit to follow um, the things you're urging us to do, the people who we need to talk to, the words we need to say. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. 
Amen.